Hermann Goering, Hermann Wilhelm Goering, or Goering, January 12, 1893, October 15, 1946, was a German political and military leader as well as one of the most powerful figures in the Nazi Party, NSDAP, that ruled Germany from 1933 to 1945. A veteran World War I fighter pilot ace, he was a recipient of the Porla Marit, the Blue Max. He was the last commander of Jagdgeschwader 1, Jasta 1, the fighter wing once led by Manfred von Richthofen. An early member of the Nazi Party, Goering was among those wounded in Adolf Hitler's failed Beer Hall Putsch in 1923. While receiving treatment for his injuries, he developed an addiction to morphine which persisted until the last year of his life. After Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in 1933, Goering was named as minister without portfolio in the new government. One of his first acts as a cabinet minister was to oversee the creation of the Gestapo, which he ceded to Heinrich Himmler in 1934. Following the establishment of the Nazi state, Goering amassed power and political capital to become the second most powerful man in Germany. He was appointed commander in chief of the Luftwaffe, Air Force, a position he held until the final days of the regime. Upon being named plenipotentiary of the four year plan in 1936, Goering was entrusted with the task of mobilizing all sectors of the economy for war, an assignment which brought numerous government agencies under his control and helped him become one of the wealthiest men in the country. After the fall of France in 1940, he was bestowed the specially created rank of Reichsmarschall, which gave him seniority over all officers in Germany's armed forces. By 1941, Goering was at the peak of his power and influence, and Hitler designated him as his successor and deputy in all his offices. As the Second World War progressed, Goering's standing with Hitler and with the German public declined after the Luftwaffe proved incapable of preventing the Allied bombing of Germany's cities and resupplying surrounded German forces in Stalingrad. Around that time, Goering increasingly withdrew from the military and political scene to devote his attention to collecting property and artwork much of which was taken from Jewish victims of the Holocaust. Informed on April 22, 1945 that Hitler intended to commit suicide, Goering sent a telegram to Hitler requesting permission to assume control of the Reich. Considering his request an act of treason, Hitler removed Goering from all his positions, expelled him from the party, and ordered his arrest. After the war, Goering was convicted of conspiracy, crimes against peace, War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity at the Nuremberg Trials. He was sentenced to death by hanging, but committed suicide by ingesting cyanide the night before the sentence was to be carried out. Goering was born on January 12, 1893, at the Marienbad Sanatorium in Rosenheim, Bavaria. His father, Heinrich Ernst Goering, October 31, 1839, 7 December 1913, a former cavalry officer had been the first governor-general of the German protectorate of Southwest Africa, modern-day Namibia. Heinrich had three children from a previous marriage. Goering was the fourth of five children by Heinrich's second wife, Franziska Tiefenbrunn, 1859-15 July 1943, a Bavarian peasant. Goering's elder siblings were Karl, Olga, and Paula, his younger brother was Albert. At the time that Goering was born, his father was serving as consul general in Haiti and his mother had returned home briefly to give birth. She left the six-week-old baby with a friend in Bavaria and did not see the child again for three years, when she and Heinrich returned to Germany. Goring's godfather was Dr. Hermann Eppenstein, a wealthy Jewish physician and businessman his father had met in Africa. Eppenstein provided the Goring family, who were surviving on Heinrich's pension, first with a family home in Berlin Friedenau, then in a small castle called Waldenstein, near Nuremberg. Goring's mother became Eppenstein's mistress around this time, and remained so for some 15 years. Eppenstein acquired the minor title of Ritter, Knight, von Eppenstein through service and donations to the Crown. Interested in a career as a soldier from a very early age, Goring enjoyed playing with toy soldiers and dressing up in a Boer uniform his father had given him. He was sent to boarding school at age 11, where the food was poor and discipline was harsh. He sold the violin to pay for his train ticket home, and then took to his bed feigning illness, until he was told he would not have to return. He continued to enjoy war games, pretending to lay siege to the castle Valdenstein and studying Teutonic legends and sagas. He became a mountain climber, scaling peaks in Germany, at the Mont Blanc Massif, and in the Austrian Alps. At 16 he was sent to a military academy at berlin Lichterfelde, from which he graduated with distinction. During the Nuremberg war crimes trials in 1946, Psychologist Gustav Gilbert measured him as having an intelligence quotient, IQ, of 138. 
Act, Goering joined the Prince Wilhelm Regiment, 112th Infantry, of the Prussian Army in 1912. The next year his mother had a falling out with Eppenstein. The family was forced to leave Weldenstein and move to Munich, Goring's father died shortly afterwards. When World War I began in August 1914, Goering was stationed at Mulhouse with his regiment. During the first year of World War I, Goering served with his infantry regiment in the area of Mulhausen, a garrison town less than two kilometers from the French frontier. He was hospitalized with rheumatism, a result of the damp of trench warfare. While he was recovering, his friend Bruno Luerzer convinced him to transfer to what would become, by October 1916, the Luftstreitkraft, air combat forces, of the German army, but his request was turned down. Later that year, Goering flew as Luerzer's observer in Feldfliegerabteilung 25. At the FA-25, Goering had informally transferred himself. He was discovered and sentenced to three weeks' confinement to barracks, but the sentence was never carried out. By the time it was supposed to be imposed, Goering's association with Luerzer had been made official. They were assigned as a team to FFA-25 in the Crown Prince's 5th Army. They flew reconnaissance and bombing missions, for which the Crown Prince invested both Goering and Luerzer with the Iron Cross, first class. After completing the pilot's training course, Goering was assigned to Jagdstaffel 5. Seriously wounded in the hip in aerial combat, he took nearly a year to recover. He then was transferred to Jagdstaffel 26, commanded by Luerzer, in February 1917. He steadily scored air victories until May, when he was assigned to command Jagdstaffel 27. Serving with Jastis 5, 26, and 27, he continued to win victories. In addition to his Iron Crosses, first and second class, he received the Tsaringer Lion with swords, the Friedrich Order, the House Order of Hohenzollern with swords third class, and finally, in May 1918, the coveted Poor Limerite. According to Hermann Dahlmann, who knew both men, Goering had Luerzer lobby for the word. He finished the war with 22 victories. A thorough post-war examination of Allied loss records showed that only two of his awarded victories were doubtful. Three were possible and 17 were certain, or highly likely. On July 7, 1918, following the death of Wilhelm Reinhardt, successor to Manfred von Richthofen, Goering was made commander of the famed flying circus, Jagdgeschwader 1. His arrogance made him unpopular with the men of his squadron. In the last days of the war, Goering was repeatedly ordered to withdraw his squadron, first to Tellencourt Airdrome, then to Darmstadt. At one point, he was ordered to surrender the aircraft to the Allies, he refused. Many of his pilots intentionally crash-landed their planes to keep them from falling into enemy hands. Like many other German veterans, Goering was a proponent of the stab in the back legend, the belief which held that the German army had not really lost the war, but instead was betrayed by the civilian leadership, Marxists, Jews, and especially the Republicans, who had overthrown the German monarchy. Goering remained in aviation after the war. He tried barnstorming and briefly worked at Fokker. After spending most of 1919 living in Denmark, he moved to Sweden and joined Svensk Luftrafik, a Swedish airline. Goering was often hired for private flights. During the winter of 1920-1921, he was hired by Count Erik van Rosen to fly him to his castle from Stockholm. Invited to spend the night, Goering may at this time have first seen the swastikumplum, which Rosen had set in the chimney piece as a family badge. This was also the first time that Goering saw his future wife, the Count introduced his sister-in-law, Baroness Karin von Konsau, née Frein von Falk. Estranged from her husband of ten years, she had an eight-year-old son. Goering was immediately infatuated and asked her to meet him in Stockholm. They arranged a visit at the home of her parents and spent much time together through 1921, when Goering left for Munich to take political science at the university. Karin obtained a divorce, followed Goering to Munich, and married him on February 3, 1922. Their first home together was a hunting lodge at Hochkreut in the Bavarian Alps, near Bayrischsel, some from Munich. After Goering met Adolf Hitler and joined the Nazi Party, NSDAP, in 1922, they moved to Obermensing, a suburb of Munich. Goering joined the Nazi party in 1922 after hearing a speech by Hitler. He was given command of the Sturmabteilung, SA, as the Oberster SA Führer in 1923. He was later appointed an SA Group and Führer, Lieutenant General, and held this rank on the SA rolls until 1945. At this time, Karin, who liked Hitler, often played hostess to meetings of leading Nazis, including her husband. Hitler, 
Rudolf Hess, Alfred Rosenberg, and Ernst Röhm. Hitler later recalled his early association with Goering. Hitler and the Nazi Party held mass meetings and rallies in Munich and elsewhere during the early 1920s, attempting to gain supporters in a bid for political power. Inspired by Benito Mussolini's march on Rome, the Nazis attempted to seize power on 8 November 9, 1923 in a failed coup known as the Beerhall Putsch. Goering, who was with Hitler leading the march to the war ministry, was shot in the leg. Fourteen Nazis and four policemen were killed, many top Nazis, including Hitler, were arrested. With Karin's help, Goering was smuggled to Innsbruck, where he received surgery and was given morphine for the pain. He remained in hospital until 24 December. This was the beginning of his morphine addiction, which lasted until his imprisonment at Nuremberg. Meanwhile, the authorities in Munich declared Goring a wanted man. The Gorings, acutely short of funds and reliant on the goodwill of Nazi sympathizers abroad, moved from Austria to Venice. In May 1924, they visited Rome, via Florence and Siena. Goering met Mussolini, who expressed an interest in meeting Hitler, who was by then in prison. Personal problems continued to multiply. By 1925, Karin's mother was ill. The Gurings, with difficulty, raised the money in the spring of 1925 for a journey to Sweden via Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Danzig, now Gdansk. Goering had become a violent morphine addict, Karin's family were shocked by his deterioration. Karin, who was ill with epilepsy and a weak heart, had to allow the doctors to take charge of Goring. Her son was taken by his father. Goering was certified a dangerous drug addict and was placed in Langbro Asylum on September 1, 1925. He was violent to the point where he had to be confined even a straight jacket, but his psychiatrist felt he was sane, the condition was caused solely by the morphine. Weaned off the drug, he left the facility briefly, but had to return for further treatment. He returned to Germany when an amnesty was declared in 1927 and resumed working in the aircraft industry. Hitler who had written Mein Kampf while in prison, had been released in December 1924. Karin Goering, ill with epilepsy and tuberculosis, died of heart failure on October 17, 1931. Meanwhile, the NSDAP was in a period of rebuilding and waiting. The economy had recovered, which meant fewer opportunities for the Nazis to agitate for change. The SA was reorganized, but with Franz Pfeffer van Salomon as its head rather than Goering, and the Schutzstaffel. SS, was founded in 1925, initially as a bodyguard for Hitler. Membership in the party increased from 27,000 in 1925 to 108,000 in 1928 and 178,000 in 1929. In the May 1928 elections, the NSDAP only obtained 12 seats out of an available 491 in the Reichstag. Goering was elected as a representative from Bavaria. The Great Depression led to a disastrous downturn in the German economy. And in the 1930 election, the NSDAP won 6,409,600 votes and 107 seats. In May 1931, Hitler sent Goering on a mission to the Vatican, where he met the future Pope Pius XII. In the July 1932 election, the Nazis won 230 seats to become far and away the largest party in the Reichstag. By long standing tradition, the Nazis were thus entitled to select the president of the Reichstag, and elected Goering to the post. The Reichstag fire occurred on the night of February 27, 1933. Goering was one of the first to arrive on the scene. Marinus van der Lubbe, a communist radical, was arrested and claimed sole responsibility for the fire. Goering immediately called for a crackdown on communists. The Nazis took advantage of the fire to advance their own political aims. The Reichstag fire decree, passed the next day on Hitler's urging, suspended basic rights and allowed detention without trial. Activities of the German Communist Party were suppressed, and some 4,000 party members were arrested. Goering demanded that the detainees should be shot, but Rudolf Diels, head of the Prussian political police, ignored the order. Some researchers, including William L. Shirer and Alan Bullock, are of the opinion that the NSDAP itself was responsible for starting the fire. At the Nuremberg trials, General Franz Halder testified that Goering admitted responsibility for starting the fire. He said that, at a luncheon held on Hitler's birthday in 1942, Goering said, The only one who really knows about the Reichstag is I, because I set it on fire. In his own Nuremberg testimony, Goering denied this story. During the early 1930s, Goering was often in the company of Emmy Sonnemann, an actress from Hamburg. They were married on April 10, 1935 in Berlin, 
The wedding was celebrated on a huge scale. A large reception was held the night before at the Berlin Opera House. Fighter aircraft flew overhead on the night off the reception and the day of the ceremony, at which Hitler was best man. Goring's daughter, Etta, was born on June 2, 1938. When Hitler was named Chancellor of Germany in January 1933, Goering was appointed as Minister without Portfolio, Minister of the Interior for Prussia, and Reich Commissioner of Aviation. Wilhelm Frick was named Reich Interior Minister. Frick and head of the Schutzstaffel, SS, Heinrich Himmler hoped to create a unified police force for all of Germany, but Goering on November 30, 1933 established a Prussian police force, with Rudolf Diels at its head. The force was called the Geheime Staatspolizei, or Gestapo. Goering, thinking that Diels was not ruthless enough to use the Gestapo effectively to counteract the power of the SA, handed over control of the Gestapo to Himmler on April 20, 1934. By this time, the SA numbered over 2 million men. Hitler was deeply concerned that Ernst Röhm, the chief of the SA, was planning a coup. Himmler and Reinhard Heydrich plotted with Göring to use the Gestapo and SS to crush the SA. Members of the SA got wind of the proposed action and thousands of them took to the streets in violent demonstrations on the night off June 29, 1934. Enraged, Hitler ordered the arrest of the SA leadership. Röhm was shot dead in his cell when he refused to commit suicide. Göring personally went over the lists of detainees, numbering in the thousands, and determined who else should be shot. At least 85 people were killed in the period of 30 June 8 2nd of July, which is now known as the Night of the Long Knives. Hitler admitted in the Reichstag on 13th of July that the killings had been entirely illegal, but claimed a plot had been underway to overthrow the Reich. A retroactive law was passed making the action legal. Any criticism was met with arrest. One of the terms of the Treaty of Versailles which had been in place since the end of World War I, stated that Germany was not allowed to maintain an air force. After the 1926 signing of the Kellogg-Briand Pact, police aircraft were permitted. Goering was appointed air traffic minister in May 1933. Germany began to accumulate aircraft in violation of the treaty, and in 1935 the existence of the Luftwaffe was formally acknowledged, with Goering as Reich aviation minister. During a cabinet meeting in September 1936, Goering and Hitler announced that the German rearmament program must be sped up. Out on 18th of October, Hitler named Goering as plenipotentiary of the four-year plan to undertake this task. Goering created a new organization to administer the plane and drew the ministries of labor and agriculture under its umbrella. He bypassed the economics ministry in his policy-making decisions, to the chagrin of Hjalmar Schacht, the minister in charge. Huge expenditures were made on rearmament, in spite of growing deficits. Schacht resigned on December 8, 1937, and Walter Funk took over the position, as well as control of the Reichsbank. In this way, both of these institutions were brought under Goring's control under the auspices of the four year plan. In July 1937, the Reichswerke Hermann Goring was established under state ownership, though led by Goring, with the aim of boosting steel production beyond the level which private enterprise could economically provide. In 1938, Goering was involved in the Blomberg Fritsch affair, which led to the resignations of the war minister, General Feldmarschall Werner von Blomberg, and the army commander, General Werner von Fritsch. Goering had acted as witness at Blomberg's wedding to Margaret Grun, a 26 year old typist, on January 12, 1938. Information received from the police showed that the young bride was a prostitute. Goering felt obligated to tell Hitler but also saw this event as an opportunity to dispose of Blomberg. Blomberg was forced to resign. Goering did not want Fritsch to be appointed to that position and thus be his superior. Several days later, Heydrich revealed a file on Fritsch that contained allegations of homosexual activity and blackmail. The charges were later proven to be false, but Fritsch had lost Hitler's trust and was forced to resign. Hitler used the dismissals as an opportunity to reshuffle the leadership of the military. Goering asked for the post of war minister but was turned down, he was appointed to the rank of General Feldmarschall. Hitler took over as supreme commander of the armed forces and created subordinate posts to head the three main branches of service. As minister in charge of the four-year plan, Goering became concerned with the lack of natural resources in Germany, and began pushing for Austria to be incorporated into the Reich. The province of Styria had rich iron ore deposits, and the country as a whole was home to many skilled laborers that would also be useful. Hitler had always been in favor of a takeover of Austria, his native country. 
he met on February 12, 1938 with Austrian Chancellor Kurt Schuschnigg, threatening invasion if peaceful unification was not forthcoming. The Nazi party was made legal in Austria to gain a power base, and a referendum on reunification was scheduled for March. When Hitler did not approve of the wording of the plebiscite, Göring telephoned Schuschnigg and Austrian head of state Wilhelm Michaelis to demand Schuschnigg's resignation, threatening invasion by German troops and civil unrest by the Austrian Nazi party members. Schuschnigg resigned on 11th of March and the plebiscite was cancelled. By 5.30 the next morning, German troops that had been massing on the border marched into Austria, meeting no resistance. Although Joachim von Ribbentrop had been named foreign minister in February 1938, Göring continued to involve himself in foreign affairs. That July, he contacted the British government with the idea that he should make an official visit to discuss Germany's intentions for Czechoslovakia. Neville Chamberlain was in favor of a meeting, and there was talk of a pact being signed between Britain and Germany. In February 1938, Göring visited Warsaw to quell rumors about the upcoming invasion of Poland. He had conversations with the Hungarian government that summer as well, discussing their potential role in an invasion of Czechoslovakia. At the Nuremberg rally that September, Goering and other speakers denounced its Czechs as an inferior race that must be conquered. Chamberlain met with Hitler in a series of meetings that led to the signing of the Munich Agreement, 29 September 1938, which turned over control of the Sudetenland to Germany. In March 1939, Goering threatened Czechoslovak President Emil Acha with the bombing of Prague. Acha then agreed to sign a communique accepting the German occupation of the remainder of Bohemia and Moravia. Although many in the party disliked him, before the war Goering enjoyed widespread personal popularity among the German public because of his perceived sociability, color and humor. As the Nazi leader most responsible for economic matters, he presented himself as a champion of national interests over allegedly corrupt big business and the old German elite. The Nazi press was on Goering's side. Other leaders, such as Hess and Ribbentrop, were envious of his popularity. In Britain and the United States, some viewed Goering as more acceptable than the other Nazis and as a possible mediator between the Western democracies and Hitler. Goering and other senior officers were concerned that Germany was not yet ready for war, but Hitler insisted on pushing ahead as soon as possible. The invasion of Poland, the opening action of World War II, began at dawn on September 1, 1939. Later in the day, speaking to the Reichstag, Hitler designated Goering as his successor as Führer of all Germany, if anything should befall me, with Hess as the second alternate. Big German victories followed one after the other in quick succession. With the help of the Luftwaffe, the Polish Air Force was defeated within a week. The Fallschirm Jäger seized vital airfields in Norway and captured Fort Eben Mail in Belgium. Goering's Luftwaffe played critical roles in the battles of the Netherlands, Belgium, and France in May 1940. After the fall of France, Hitler awarded Goring the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross for his successful leadership. During the 1940 field marshal ceremony, Hitler promoted Goring to the rank of Reichsmarschall des Großdeutschen Reiches, Reich Marshal of the Greater German Reich, a special rank which made him senior to all field marshals in the military, including the Luftwaffe. As a result of his promotion, he was then the top-ranking soldier of all Germany until the end of the war. Goering had already received the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross on September 30, 1939 as Commander-in-Chief of the Luftwaffe. The UK had declared war on Germany immediately after the invasion of Poland. In July 1940, Hitler began preparations for an invasion of Britain. As part of the plan, the Royal Air Force, RAF, had to be neutralized. Bombing raids commenced on British air installations and on cities and centers of industry. Goering had by then already announced in a radio speech, if as much as a single enemy aircraft flies over German soil, my name is Meyer, something that would return to haunt him, when the RAF began bombing German cities on May 11, 1940. Though he was confident the Luftwaffe could defeat the RAF within days, Goering, like Admiral Erich Reiter, commander-in-chief of the Kriegsmarine, Navy, was pessimistic about the chance of success of the planned invasion, codenamed Operation Sea Lion. Goering hoped that a victory in the air would be enough to force peace without an invasion. The campaign failed, and Sea Lion was postponed indefinitely on September 17, 1940. After their defeat in the Battle of Britain, the Luftwaffe attempted to defeat Britain by a strategic bombing. On October 12, 1940, Hitler cancelled Sea Lion due to the onset of winter. By the end of the year, it was clear that British morale was not being shaken by the Blitz, though the bombings continued through May 1941. In spite of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, 
signed in 1939, Nazi Germany began Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, on June 22, 1941. Initially, the Luftwaffe was at an advantage, destroying thousands of Soviet aircraft in the first month of fighting. Hitler and his top staff were sure that the campaign would be over by Christmas, and no provisions were made for reserves of men or equipment. But, by July, the Germans had only 1,000 planes remaining in operation, and their troop losses were over 213,000 men. The choice was made to concentrate the attack on only one part of the vast front, efforts would be directed at capturing Moscow. After the long, but successful, Battle of Smolensk, Hitler ordered Army Group Center to halt its advance at Moscow and temporarily diverted its panzer groups north and south to aid in the encirclement of Leningrad and Kiev. The pause provided the Red Army with an opportunity to mobilize fresh reserves. Historian Russell Stolfi considers it to be one of the major factors that caused the failure of the Moscow offensive, which was resumed in October 1941 with the Battle of Moscow. Poor weather conditions, fuel shortages, a delay in building aircraft bases in Eastern Europe and overstretched supply lines were also factors. Hitler did not give permission for even a partial retreat until mid-January 1942, by this time the losses were comparable to those of the French invasion of Russia in 1812. Hitler decided that the summer 1942 campaign would be concentrated in the south, efforts would be made to capture the oil fields in the Caucasus. The Battle of Stalingrad, a major turning point of the war began on August 23, 1942 with a bombing campaign by the Luftwaffe. The 6th Army entered the city, but because of its location on the front line, it was still possible for the Soviets to encircle and trap it there without reinforcements or supplies. When the 6th Army was surrounded by the end of November in Operation Uranus, Goering promised that the Luftwaffe would be able to deliver a minimum of 300 tons of supplies to the trapped men every day. On the basis of these assurances, Hitler demanded that there be no retreat they were to fight till the last man. Though some airlifts were able to get through, the amount of supplies delivered never exceeded 120 tons per day. The remnants of the German 6th Army, some 91,000 men out of an army of 285,000, surrendered in early February 1943, only 5,000 of these captives survive at Prussian prisoner of war camps to see Germany again. Meanwhile, the strength of the U.S. and British bomber fleets had increased. Based in Britain, they began operations against German targets. The first thousand bomber raid was staged on Cologne on May 30, 1942. Air raids continued on targets further from England after auxiliary fuel tanks were installed in U.S. fighter aircraft. Goering refused to believe reports that American fighters had been shot down as far east as Aachen in winter 1943. His reputation began to decline. The American P 51 Mustang, with a combat radius of over when using underwing drop tanks, began to escort the bombers in large formations to and from the target area in early 1944. From that point onwards, the Luftwaffe began to suffer casualties in air crews that could not sufficiently replace. By targeting oil refineries and rail communications, Allied bombers crippled the German war effort by late 1944. German civilians blamed Goering for his failure to protect the homeland. Hitler began excluding him from conferences, but continued him in his positions at the head of the Luftwaffe and as plenipotentiary off the four-year plan. As he lost Hitler's trust, Goering began to spend more time at his various residences. On D-Day, June 6, 1944, the Luftwaffe only had some 300 fighters and a small number of bombers in the area of the landings, the Allies had a total strength of 11,000 aircraft. As the Soviets approached Berlin, Hitler's efforts to organize the defense of the city became ever more meaningless and futile. His last birthday, celebrated at the Fuhrer bunker in Berlin on April 20, 1945, was the occasion for leave taking for many top Nazis, Goering included. By this time, Karin Hall had been evacuated, the building destroyed, and its art treasures moved to Berchtesgaden and elsewhere. Goering arrived at his estate at Obersalzberg on 22 April, the same day that Hitler, in a lengthy diatribe against his generals, first publicly admitted that the war is lost and that he intended to remain in Berlin to the end and then commit suicide. He also stated that Goering was in a better position to negotiate a peace settlement. In 1941, a week after the start of the Soviet invasion, Hitler had issued a decree naming Goering his successor in the event of his death. OKW Operations Chief Alfred Yodel was present for Hitler's rant, and notified Goering's chief of staff, Karl Koller. At a meeting a few hours later. Sensing its implications, Koller immediately flew to Berchtesgaden to notify Goering, 
who feared being accused of treason if he tried to take power. On the other hand, if he did nothing, he feared being accused of dereliction of duty. After some hesitation, Goering reviewed his copy of the 1941 decree naming him Hitler's successor. It not only placed Goering first in the line of succession, but also stated that, if Hitler ever lost his freedom of action, Goering had complete authority to act on Hitler's behalf as his deputy. After conferring with Koller and Hans Lammers, the state secretary of the Reich Chancellery, Goering concluded that, by remaining in Berlin to face certain death, Hitler had incapacitated himself from governing. All agreed that Goering therefore had a clear duty to take power in Hitler's stead. He was also motivated by fears that his rival, Martin Bormann, would seize power upon Hitler's death and would have him killed as a traitor. With this in mind, Goering sent a carefully worded telegram asking Hitler for permission to take over as the leader of Germany, stressing that he would be acting as Hitler's deputy. He added that, if Hitler did not reply by 2200 hours that night, 23rd of April, he would assume that Hitler had indeed lost his freedom of action, and would assume leadership of the Reich. The telegram was intercepted by Bormann, who convinced Hitler that Goering was a traitor and that the telegram was a demand to resign or be overthrown. Hitler sent a reply to Goering prepared with Bormann's help informing him that, unless he resigned immediately, he would be executed for high treason. Soon afterward, Hitler removed Goering from all of his offices and ordered Goering, his staff, and Lammers placed under house arrest at Oberzaltzwerk. Bormann made an announcement over the radio that Goering had resigned for health reasons. By 26 April, the complex at Oberzaltzberg was under attack by the Allies, so Goering was moved to his castle at Moderndorf. In his last will and testament, Hitler expelled Goering from the party and formally rescinded the decree making him his successor. He then appointed Karl Dunitz, the Navy's commander in chief, as president of the Reich and commander in chief of the armed forces. Hitler and his wife, Eva Braun, committed suicide on April 30, 1945, a few hours after a hastily arranged wedding. Goering was freed on 5 of May by a passing Luftwaffe on it, and he made his way to the U.S. lines in hopes of surrendering to them rather than to the Soviets. He was taken into custody near Ratstadt on 6 of May by elements of the 36th Infantry Division of the U.S. Army. This move likely saved Goering's life, Bormann had ordered him executed if Berlin had fallen. Goering was flown to Camp Pashkan, a temporary prisoner of war camp housed in the Palace Hotel at Mundorf Le Bains, Luxembourg. Here he was weaned off dihydrocodone, a mild morphine derivative. He had been taking the equivalent of three or four grains, 260 to 320 milligrams, of morphine a day, and was put on a strict diet. He lost. His IQ was tested while in custody and found to be 138. Top Nazi officials were transferred in September to Nuremberg, which was to be the location of a series of military tribunals beginning in November. Goering was the second highest ranking Nazi official tried at Nuremberg, behind Reich President, former Admiral, Karl Dunitz. The prosecution leveled an indictment of four charges, including a charge of conspiracy, waging a war of aggression, war crimes, including the plundering and removal to Germany of works of art and other property, and crimes against humanity including the disappearance of political and other opponents under Thnacht und Nebel, Night and Fog, Decree, the torture and ill-treatment of prisoners of war, and the murder and enslavement of civilians, including what was at the time estimated to be 5,700,000 Jews. Not permitted to present a lengthy statement, Goering declared himself to be in the sense of indictment not guilty. The trial lasted 218 days, the prosecution presented their case from November through March and Goring's defense ethy first to be present it lasted from 8 to 22 March. The sentences were read out on September 30, 1946. Goering, forced to remain silent while seated in the dock, communicated his opinions about the proceedings using gestures, shaking his head, or laughing. He constantly took notes and whispered with the other defendants, and tried to control the erratic behavior of Hess, who was seated beside him. During breaks in the proceedings, Goering tried to dominate the other defendants, and he was eventually placed in solitary confinement when he attempted to influence their testimony. Goering told U.S. psychiatrist Leon Goldenstone that the court was stupid to try little fellows like Funk and Carlton Brunner instead of letting Goering take all the blame on himself. He also claimed that he had never heard of most of the other defendants before the trial. Captain Gustav Gilbert, a German-speaking U.S. intelligence officer and psychologist, interviewed Goering and the others in prison during the trial. Gilbert kept a journal, which he later published as Nuremberg Diary. Here he describes Goering on the evening of April 18, 1946, as the trials were halted for a three-day Easter recess. 
On several occasions over the course of the trial, the prosecution showed films of the concentration camps and other atrocities. Everyone present, including Goering, found the contents of the films shocking. He said that the films must have been fake. Witnesses, including Paul Kerner and Erhard Milch, tried to portray Goering as a peaceful moderate. Milch stated it had been impossible to oppose Hitler or disobey his orders, to do so would likely have meant death for oneself and one's family. When testifying on his own behalf, Goering emphasized his loyalty to Hitler, and claimed to know nothing about what had happened in the concentration camps, which were under Himmler's control. He gave evasive, convoluted answers to direct questions and had plausible excuses for all his actions during the war. He used the witness stand as a venue to expound at great length on his own role in the Reich, attempting to present himself as a peacemaker and diplomat before the outbreak of the war. During cross examination, Chief Prosecutor Robert H. Jackson read out the minutes of a meeting that had been held shortly after Kristallnacht, a major pogrom in November 1938. At the meeting, Goering had plotted to confiscate Jewish property in the wake of the pogrom. Later, David Maxwell Fife proved it was impossible for Goering not to have known about the Stalag Luft three murders the shooting of 50 airmen who had been recaptured after escaping from Stalag Luft in time to have prevented the killings. He also presented clear evidence that Goering knew about the extermination of the Hungarian Jews. Goering was found guilty on all four counts and was sentenced to death by hanging. The judgment stated. Goering made an appeal asking to be shot as a soldier instead of hanged as a common criminal, but the court refused. Defying the sentence imposed by his captors, he committed suicide with a potassium cyanide capsule the night before he was to be hanged. One theory as to how Goering obtained the poison holds that U.S. Army Lieutenant Jack G. Wheelis, who was stationed at the Nuremberg Trials, retrieved the capsules from their hiding place among Goering's personal effects that had been confiscated by the Army and handed them over to the prisoner, after being bribed by Goering, who gave him his gold watch, pen, and cigarette case. In 2005, former U.S. Army Private Herbert Lee Stivers, who served in the 1st Infantry Division's 26th Infantry Regiment Honor Guard for the Nuremberg Trials claimed he gave Goering medicine hidden inside a fountain pen that a German woman had asked him to smuggle into the prison. Stivers later said that he did not know what was in the pill until after Goering's suicide. Goering's body, as with those of the men who were executed, was displayed at the execution ground for the witnesses of the executions. The bodies were cremated at Ostfredhof, Munich, and the ashes were scattered in the Isar River. Goring's name is closely associated with the Nazi plunder of Jewish property. His name appears 135 times on the OSS Art Looting Investigation Unit, a LU red flag names list compiled by U.S. Army Intelligence in 1945-6 and declassified in 1997. The confiscation of Jewish property gave Goring the opportunity to amass a personal fortune. Some properties he seized himself or acquired for a nominal price. In other cases, he collected bribes for allowing others to steal Jewish property. He took kickbacks from industrialists for favorable decisions as four-year plan director, and money for supplying arms to the Spanish Republicans in the Spanish Civil War via Pyrical in Greece, although Germany was supporting Franco and the Nationalists. Goering was appointed Reich Master of the Hunt in 1933 and Master of the German Forests in 1934. He instituted reforms to the forestry laws and acted to protect endangered species. Around this time he became interested in Schorfheide Forest, where he set aside as a state park, which is still extant. There he built an elaborate hunting lodge, Karin Hall, in memory of his first wife, Karin. By 1934, her body had been transported to the site and placed in a vault in the estate. The main lodge had a large art gallery where Goering displayed works that had been plundered from private collections and museums around Europe from 1939 onward. Goering worked closely with the Einsatzstab Reichsleiter Rosenberg, Reichsleiter Rosenberg Task Force, an organization tasked with the looting of artwork and cultural material from Jewish collections, libraries, and museums throughout Europe. Headed by Alfred Rosenberg, the task force set up a collection center and headquarters in Paris. Some 26,000 railroad cars full of art treasures, furniture, and other looted items were sent to Germany from France alone. Goering repeatedly visited the Paris headquarters to review the incoming stall and goods and to select items to be sent on a special train to Karnhall and his other homes. The estimated value of his collection, numbering some 1,500 pieces, was $200 million. Goering was known for his extravagant tastes and garish clothing. He had various special uniforms made for the many posts he held, his Reichsmarschall uniform included a jewel-encrusted baton. 
Hans Ulrich Rudel, the top Stuka pilot of the war, recalled twice meeting Goering dressed in outlandish costumes first, a medieval hunting costume, practicing archery with his doctor, and second, dressed in a red toga fasten with a golden clasp, smoking an unusually large pipe. Italian Foreign Minister Galeazzo Ciano once noted Goering wearing a fur coat that looked like what a high-grade prostitute wears to the opera. He threw lavish housewarming parties each time a round of construction was completed at Carnhall, and changed costumes several times throughout the evenings. Goering was noted for his patronage of music, especially opera. He entertained frequently and sumptuously, and hosted elaborate birthday parties for himself. Armaments Minister Albert Speer recalled that guests brought expensive gifts such as gold bars, Dutch cigars, and valuable artwork. For his birthday in 1944, Speer gave Goring an oversized marble bust of Hitler. As a member of the Prussian Council of State, Speer was required to donate a considerable portion of his salary towards the council's birthday gift to Goring without even being asked. General Feldmarschall Erhard Milch told Speer that similar donations were a required out of the Air Ministry's general fund. For his birthday in 1940, Italian Foreign Minister Count Ciano decorated Goering with the coveted collar of Annunziata. The award reduced him to tears. The design of the Reichsmarschall standard, on a light blue field, featured a gold German eagle grasping a wreath surmounted by two batons overlaid with a swastika. The reverse side of the flag had the Grosskreuz des Eisernen Kreuzes, Grand Cross of the Iron Cross, surrounded by a wreath between four Luftwaffe eagles. The flag was carried by a personal standard bearer at all public occasions. Though he liked to be called Der Eisern, the Iron Man, the once dashing and muscular fighter pilot had become corpulent. He was one of the few Nazi leaders who did not take offense at hearing jokes about himself, no matter how rude, taking them as a sign of popularity. Germans joked about his ego, saying that he would wear an admiral's uniform with rubber medals to take a bath, and his obesity, joking that he sits down on his stomach. One joke claimed that he had sent a wire to Hitler after his visit to the Vatican. Mission accomplished. Pope unfrocked. Tiara and pontifical vestments are a perfect fit. Joseph Goebbels and Himmler were far more anti Semitic than Goering, who mainly adopted that attitude because party politics required him to do so. His deputy, Erhard Milch, had a Jewish parent. But Goering supported the Nuremberg Laws of 1935, and later initiated economic measures unfavorable to Jews. He required the registration of all Jewish property as part of the four year plan and at a meeting held after Kristallnacht was livid that the financial burden for the Jewish losses would have to be made good by German-owned insurance companies. He proposed that the Jews be fined 1 billion marks. At the same meeting, options for the disposition of the Jews and their property were discussed. Jews would be segregated into ghettos or encouraged to emigrate, and their property would be seized in a program of Aryanization. Compensation for seized property would be low. If any was given at all. Detailed minutes of this meeting and other documents were read out at the Nuremberg trial, proving his knowledge of and complicity with the persecution of the Jews. He told Gilbert that he would never have supported the anti Jewish measures if he had known what was going to happen. I only thought we would eliminate Jews from positions in big business and government, he claimed. In July 1941, Goering issued a memo to Reinhard Heydrich ordering him to organize the practical details of the final solution to the Jewish question. By the time that this letter was written, many Jews and others had already been killed in Poland, Russia, and elsewhere. At the Von Zay conference, held six months later, Heydrich formally announced that genocide of the Jews was now official Reich policy. Goering did not attend the conference, but he was present at other meetings where the number of people killed was discussed. Goering directed anti-partisan operations by Luftwaffe security battalions in the Via Wovisa forest between 1942 and 1944 that resulted in the murder of thousands of Jews and Polish civilians. Goering's younger brother Albert despised Nazism, and offered active resistance to the regime, including helping prisoners escape from concentration camps. He was arrested four times, but Hermann secured his release each time. Herman's daughter Etta told The Guardian that Albert could certainly help people in need himself financially and with his personal influence, but as soon as it was necessary to involve higher authority or officials, then he had to have the support of my father, which he did get. Informational notes citations bibliography. Further reading. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.